Uh, it's time for the KMI session. It is organized by the Korea Maritime Institute, and the session will be themed the global supply chain crisis and its solution in new Cold War era. And the moderator and the presenters and discussants, uh, please come up to the stage. The moderator of this session is Professor Kim hong Su of Busan National University, and our presenters will be Professor Lee sung Ju of Chungang University and Dr. Cesar Ducuye, a senior researcher at CNRS. And um, the, the, Mr. Ducuye will be joining us online. And for the discussions, we have um, Mr. Lee Sung-woo, Chief of Regional Cooperation Committee at KMI, and Mr. Um, Jung kyu Cha, Director of Office of Macroeconomic Analysis and Forecasting at KDI, and um, Professor Lee eung yu of New Jersey City University. Now I'd like to pass the microphone to the moderator, Professor Kim. I, my name is Kim hong so I'll be moderating the session. It is very nice to meet you. In 2005, um, this Nurimaru was built, and um, and after that, at once every year, people gather here to talk about the peace on the Korean Peninsula. That's uh, the, this symposium is held once every year to every year to talk about the peace on the Korean Peninsula. And I was an advisor to the Apex Summit in 2005, and. I think I am attending the symposium about every five years. It is very nice to see all the faces that I know. And um, Professor Samsung may not remember me, but I remember you. And we have a lot of people from Busan. Uh, uh, thank you for being here with us. And uh, Hangyeore in International Symposium is sponsored by the one session of um, the symposium is sponsored by um, KMI. And I think um, they joined about two years later, the first um, symposium. We really thank you for your support. In that sense, I would like to invite um, President Kim jong Dok of, of KMI for his um, congratulatory remarks. Good afternoon. I am Kim Jong, the president of the KMI. I'd like to thank everyone uh, for being here with us, and I welcome all of you. This session uh, will be uh, presented under the topic of the uh, global supply chain crisis and its solution in new Cold War era. And the Korean Peninsula, since the late 19th century, has serving as the cross um, roads for the logistics. You know, at this crossroads, lots of um, exchanges and logistics will take place. So Busan is the seventh largest port in, um, in the world and the second largest transshipment port in the world. And this Korean Peninsula, the Korean Peninsula is, is uh, has its fate as the fate as e the big port, and it has a good possibility of expanding its role. And um, in, in that sense, I am really looking forward to the presentations and discussions that our presenters and discuss discussants will have uh, regarding the global supply chain uh, crisis and its solutions. And I look forward to your presentations and discussions. Thank you. And in the previous session, Professor Park said um, that he is looking forward to the KMI session that may come up with some concrete, concrete solutions. The topics that we are going to look at today here are the um, U.S.-China hegemony struggle and the new Cold War era. 
In the previous ses sessions, we looked at the expansion of um, NATO, and in the second session, we talk talked about the um, the East Asian crisis, and now we are going to talk about the global supply chain crisis in the new Cold War era. And uh, Professor Lee Sung Ju will uh, present us on the global uh, supply chain crisis from the international politics. And on the other hand, Dr. Duik Kurie from France, and he visits um, Korea often and he does lots of researches with the KMI. And he will uh, give us the implications that the new Cold War era will have the global supply chain and the ports of Busan. Let me first introduce Professor Yi Sun Ju. Please refer to the book uh, um, where his profile is uh, written. And he is a professor of political science and international uh, in, uh, relations at Chungang University. He also served as a professor of um, National University of um, Singapore. And uh, Professor Lee, you have 20 minutes for presentations. And this, each discussant will be given six minutes. And during the presentations and discussions, if you have any questions, please write down the questions and uh, give us the question paper to us so that we can um, have the Q&A session. Without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Lee for the presentation. Once again, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Yi Sung Ju from Chungang University. Well, it is my great honor to have an opportunity to deliver a presentation in front of these distinguished guests, including, I mean, prominent experts. So I hope that I mean, my presentation will serve as a really good stepping stone to have a further heated discussions with fruitful, I mean, ideas. What I'd like to tell you today is actually three things. I mean, yes, we've been talked a lot about the global supply chains, but I mean, what kind of changes we have I mean, seen and what are the characteristics of such changes? And in the middle of such changes, uh, I mean, how South Korea should respond? I think it's maybe the right time for us to do that. The first thing I'd like to tell you is that the restructuring of the supply chain, yes, maybe recently it's, I mean, to come into the spotlight, but it's not something that happens just overnight. Well, this is, I mean, together with the rising, I mean, economic progress of, I mean, China, it has been some time that the, I mean, global supply chain has re been restructuring. I mean, obviously, the economic rise of China, it's well known, but in the 2000s, it was quite visible. And I mean, beyond that, it was quite, I mean, highlighted several times because it was really prominent, sometimes posing threats, sometimes, I mean, giving opportunities. But in more detail, I mean, for the last two decades, I mean, together with the rising, I mean, Chinese economy, what kind of changes we experienced? The first one is that in Asia and East Asia, the supply chain has been continuously expanding geographically. That's one thing I'd like to highlight. I mean, what it means is that, I mean, as China, um, Chinese economy grew, I mean, their economic structure has been upgrade, uh, has upgraded from a low value, I mean, ones to high value added ones. And as a result, I mean, geographically, I mean, the supply chain, at least in East Asia, has been expanding as well. So for the last 20 years, I mean, following up on the, I mean, the evolution of uh, global supply chain, I mean, restructuring, many players are newly joined in this, I mean, changing structure. What kind of returns it created? I mean, the first one is the global imbalance. Well, in fact, back in 19, 2019, when there was a U.S.-China trade war started, I mean, there were some people just still thinking that's just between the two countries. But if you look more in detail, I mean, 
there were quite serious structural, I mean, element that is closely related to the global supply chain. I mean, simply put, China imported, I mean, a lot of parts and materials, raw materials from other countries in the region, and then they exported, I mean, finished the goods to other countries around the world, including the U.S. and Europe. And in this process, I mean, the so-called trade imbalance was, I mean, brought to the scene. And obviously, this was, again, not something that was, I mean, hidden or not happened before. But it always, it has been, it was there for quite a long time. But it was actually obviously viewed, I mean, on the surface. Yes, maybe on the surface, it's just between the two, US and China, they are trade one. But directly and indirectly, especially Asian countries, many Asian countries are involved as well. And second point I'd like to tell you is that at the end of the day, China, within the I mean, supply chain in the region, they again constantly upgraded themselves. So they are now, I mean, in, in as serving as a hub. So it's no longer just China problem. The main, the true nature of the I mean, the supply chain in the region has changed as well. So. Simply put, the hierarchy of the global supply chain is now more rigid than before, or it has become more, I mean, vertical. So, I mean, yes, people often say China is the, I mean, the factory of the world, but in the process, I mean, it has built hierarchical, I mean, trade relationships with many countries around the world, and it has been expanding and it's been intensifying. And what kind of consequences it has generated? Yes, there are, I mean, geopolitical issues in play as well. Well, most of the, I mean, East Asian countries are so-called, I mean, having difficulty, so-called asymmetrical, I mean, in trade issues. It's not a problem for just a single country. Many countries are having the same issue, especially in the region. So, I mean, delivering this concern to China is actually building its power. So back in 2016, maybe you already know, in Korea, back then, the previous government, I mean, decided to install that, I mean, defense system. So it's kind of, I mean, the official, un unofficial, I mean, coercion. So, of course, there are many different, I mean, elements in play, but this, I mean, shouldn't have happened if we did not have that kind of this asymmetrical, I mean, trade relationship with China. So this is kind of, I mean, asymmetrical trade or economic dependency on China has been one of our, I mean, disadvantages. So, for example, rare earth materials, I mean, China at one point stopped exporting, I mean, rare earth materials to its, I mean, partner countries or trade partners, including South Korea. This obviously, I mean, the Delta blow as well. And one more thing I'd like to add is that, but at the end of the day, Yes, at the moment we are faced with this difficult, I mean, challenge of asymmetric trade, I mean, imbalance with China. But this is not the only relationship we have. In some other, I mean, industries, we have a really good, I mean, reciprocal, I mean, trade relations. For example, the semiconductor industry. So. If you look at them I mean, as a kind of a total volume perspective, there are, yes, several challenges, but there are other, I mean, solutions already there that we can actually tap into. And this is also recognized by China recently as well. So they are taking more cautious steps compared to what they have done before in the past. So again, I mean, for some industries and for some technology sectors, there are kind of a two-way collaborative trade relationships. But what I'd like to tell you is that, I mean, together with the rising, I mean, economic power of China, the supply chain in East Asia has gone through a significant, I mean, structure change, and that also affected social and political, I mean, conditions as well. And next, I'd like to move on. I mean, there are a couple of elements I mean, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic that I cannot leave out. What kind of changes did it bring? I mean, for example, so far, when you talk about, I mean, supply chain, I mean, it was almost always about, I mean, designing it to maximize, I mean, efficiency. But 
with the I mean, COVID pandemic rapidly sweeping through the world, I mean, everyone suffered. At the same time, the I mean, the supply chain disruption. But if you look deeper inside of it, I mean, at some point, certain problems, I mean, actually triggered the entire disruption of the supply chain across the world. So those kind of issues or points we call bottleneck or bottleneck points. So with bottleneck points, we couldn't, it was really hard for us to avoid a disruption in the supply chain. So we came to realize that, I mean, we always focused in the past that uh, how to maximize, I mean, efficiency, but actually the global supply chain was way more vulnerable than we thought it would be. So um, not just on the global or national level, even on the I mean individual level. Therefore, I mean nations, companies, and I mean reasons. Everyone tried to find how to actually reduce this I mean or enhance the vulnerability of the I mean global supply chain. And as you already know, several I mean corporations and many countries around the world now try to diversify their supply chains. But, I mean, I mean, there are also the geopolitical, I mean, consequences as well. The, one of them is, in fact, I mean, for ordinary people, I mean, in our daily lives, they do not pay much attention on the, I mean, the global supply chain. But now, many people are showing great interest in the supply chain. And some are actually directly, indirectly experienced, uh, I mean, the, the impact of the disruption of the global supply chain. That is the reason why in Korea, I mean, the ordinary consumers, I mean, the damages they suffered were relatively small. But in other countries like in U.S. and other advanced nations, the disruption in the supply chain, it actually generated a significant impact on adverse impact on the daily lives of ordinary people in particular for I mean daily necessities and when COVID-19 was fast spread spreading I mean we did not have the pharmaceuticals I mean medical products and others we definitely need to overcome or to, I mean to win our fight against this pandemic therefore it's, it actually intensified I mean growing interest on how to secure and diversify the global supply chain and our dependency on this proportionate I mean source of I mean our supplies so I mean in the beginning of the COVID pandemic when it spread across the world I mean China actually decided to block, I mean, the exports sanctions, for example, I mean, face masks and other medical equipment and products. China decided not to export it to other countries, and that gave a great impact. I mean, it was almost shocking to the U.S. and other, I mean, advanced, I mean, countries. For example, like I mean, 3M, that's a kind of, I mean, U.S. company, and for ordinary people, it was really hard for hard to understand. I mean, it's an American company; they produce these face masks and others, but we cannot purchase it on this, I mean, American soil. At the end of the day, it's made in China. That's the reason why. So they come to realize this, I mean, the disruption or distortion of the global supply chain. There disproportionate, I mean, dependency on China or existing supply chain. And such changes in the perception of the public uh, made the, uh, served as the background for the political circles to change the supply chain. Let me go to my third point. And with the uh, global supply chain restructuring and the uh, military confrontation uh, or strategic confrontation between the U.S. and China cannot be severed uh, from, I mean, the global supply chain and the um, strict strategic confrontation between the U.S. and China cannot be separated. And this U.S.-China confrontation, well, in the past there was hegemony struggle, but what how is it different from the current um, hegemonic um, struggle? In the Cold War era, if you look at the competition between the U.S. and Soviet Union, and how did the how West um, described um, the Soviet Union was it was an iron um, wall. That means um, the West and the East was separated. 
So the two countries that are struggling over the hegemony do not uh, depend on each other. That was uh, the norm that was shown in the Cold War era. It was divided so that they can compete with each other. But in the case of US and China, it is different. If we use the, uh, the term again, uh, it's the bamboo wall. There is still a wall, but in between the U.S. and China, they uh, engage in trade and some economic, um, they for forged economic relations. In that sense, um, the, the two countries um, are pursuing strategic competition with on the basis of interdependence. So that's the new characteristics of the power struggle between these two um, countries. And this interdependence is also affecting the realignment of the supply chain. U.S. and China, as they are highly interdependent on each other, um, although they are competing uh, in having a lot of difficulties in their competition. And realignment of the global supply chain uh, requires um, strengthening resilience and mitigating the weaknesses. The, the global supply chain had to go through a securitization process after the pandemic. The prime example is the Trump administration's reshoring policy that was also succeeded by the Biden administration. Reshoring is a typical example of um, securitization of glo global supply chain. But the weakness of the U.S. Um, supply chain is dependence on the China, so it wants to weaken uh, such dependence on China in their uh, supply chain. But U.S. strategy towards China does not stop at just uh, mitigating the weaknesses, but they also strengthen its capability uh, as well as strengthen its international competitiveness. But the first point is to mitigate the weaknesses. So the uh, global supply chain has been realigned um, um, towards that end. And one thing I'd like to add is that should we just um, neglect the current status of um, interdependence? Well, we cannot really neglect it. The U.S. is making lots of effort to get, gain the upper hand in the competition against China, but it cannot really give up China as a market. So that's this dark um, reality. So that's the two sides of the competition between the two countries. And Korea cannot be free from such um, dual sides or double sides. And Korea seeks to lower its um, interdependent or independence on China. So uh, it, it, one of the tasks that Korea has to pursue is to lower its dependence on China. Then, you know, the U.S.'s reassuring policy is kind of a symbol of um, the securitization of um, supply chain. And reassuring is not enough for any country to secure um, economic security. And U.S. knows it, and any other countries know it. So they should come. They have should pursue other strategies as well. They focus on friend shoring or ally shoring along with reshoring. So that uh, appear in the process of securitization of global supply chain. I think such changes will only get stronger going forward. And now I'd like to talk about what should Korea do in this circumstances. First is Korea has to have a grand goal that we have to share. And one of them is to pursue inclusive economic autonomy. And the pandemic is still with this, and the strategy competition is getting fiercer and uh, throwing lots of uncertainties. And the, one of the rational um, choices that we can make is that we have to take care of ourselves first. And 
that will take um, in the form of my country first or um, mercantilism. But no matter how big the impact may be, the protectionism and the my Korea first policy cannot solve all the problems. It is all the more so for Korea, which is very much dependent on the global economy. So we have to secure uh, economic autonomy. And at the same time, we have to also pursue um, inclusiveness and openness at the same time. And inclusiveness and securing autonomy may not uh, go hand in hand. Uh, you may. You, you may think so, and you may be right, but in the times of uncertainty and changes, so we can say we are in an abnormal times, such policies should be harmonized to uh, build the capability of the country and of the people. And most of the countries around the world are moving towards this um, direction. And the second strategy that Korea has to pursue in terms of um, the global supply chain is we have to diversify. And we have very mixed views on diversification of the global su um, supply chain. Can it really help um, Korea or it? We wanted to um, diversify the supply chain to move away from Japan, and people say, was it successful? Well, diversifying or moving away from China may be more difficult. But if you look at the economic relationship between the two countries, between the Korea and China, will not stop at this phase. The rising labor costs in China and industrial upgrades or in you know, the converting to domestic economy first. Well, uh, with these changes, the current status may not be maintained. We cannot be sure the status quo will be maintained over the l next one decade. But when we diversify, we have to we can take many measures, but we have to be cautious that it's not breaking away from China. We should not send a signal to China that we are severing ties with um, China. So in that sense, we have to pursue diversify based on the universal values. And we, there are other countries that uh, share the same concerns, like um, like-minded country. We have to forge um, cooperation with the with such countries. Korea is a um, mid-class country, but you know a, a country like this cannot um, make any changes alone. But we have we can lead the changes along with our friends, and we also have to reform um, institutional framework and. So the issues are cross-cutting issues so that one department or one sector cannot solve the issues um, alone. This requires um, cooperation, and this requires reform in the institutional framework. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Professor Lee, thank you for your presentation. Busan has support, and we should we pay more attention to the realignment of the supply chain. What Professor Lee presented it is that with the rise of China, the uh, global supply chain is taking hierarchies. And because of the pandemic, um, the US policy is disrupting this global supply chain. Um, in Under the circumstances, Korea has to pursue inclusive economic autonomy, diversification, and international cooperation, uh, and uh, reform of institutional framework. And in the past, uh, if when the tr uh, President Trump is gone, we can enjoy the peace in the world. And after the pandemic is over, we also thought that the peace in the world will come. But the truth is not so. And if you look at the US strategy 22, 
they what they say is if we don't stop China now, it will harm the world economy and the U.S. So that was more so that the U.S. will have to cope with China in a more sophisticated way. So these are the the four. Uh, things that Korea has to pursue in line with the changes in the world. We have to think more, and we're going to have our second present. He's connected with via Zoom. I mean, from France. So that's uh, second presenter is uh, Dr. Cesar Decree. Please refer to the booklet for his I mean detailed I mean biography. But looking at the I mean biography, I mean. He is uh, certainly a real expert in terms of logistics and ports, including, I mean, boost and ports, I mean, combining or utilizing big data. I mean, he's actually exploring the very insightful measures. So I am very excited to have him I and mean, hear what he has to say. So once again, Dr. Decree, you have uh, 20 minutes for your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me well? Yes. Um, so, uh, I am very happy to, to be with you today. Uh, also, uh, I would be more happy to be uh, with you uh, physically in Korea. Um, I like very much uh, your country and uh, I have been working uh, in South Korea as a, as a researcher in the past and um, I, am, um, I have very good memories uh, of my work with uh, KMI uh, colleagues, uh, especially uh, Lee Song Woo, uh, and who is uh, my uh, big uh, brother. So um, I, I am happy to, to present you uh, some elements about uh, the global supply chain uh, disruption and some effects on uh, South Korean ports. Uh, my presentation will look at some recent uh, evolution of uh, uh, South Korean ports and logistics, and uh, I will try to pick up some, uh, some aspects of current uh, US-China tensions to check uh, how they, they impact uh, uh, South Korean port uh, operations and uh, development. And uh, I will also propose to focus on the specific case of uh, North Korea as a possible uh, solution uh, for the future, for inter-Korean cooperation. Um, so, uh, as you can see on the map, uh, South Korea it has a very unique uh, position or situation in Northeast Asia. Uh, it is connecting global shipping lines, uh, mainly through the, the ports of Pusan, Kwangyong, uh, uh, with deep sea uh, container carriers. Uh, this, this is actually where uh, the global supply chain is, uh, is located. Uh, the major carriers are uh, calling at these ports to, uh, for, uh, not only for Korean trade, but also for transshipment uh, at these ports to connect uh, China and uh, Japan with the rest of the world. But uh, something also important is that you also have a local or uh, short sea shipping uh, connections within Northeast Asia, which are also important uh, with Far East Russia or North China uh, between smaller ports. And I will go back to this, uh, to this later, as this is also an important uh, aspect of the, of the supply chain. It's not only about global uh, shipping, but also about regional uh, shipping. So this position of South Korea is, can be, um, has many implications um, and uh, it is accentuated by the fact that uh, South Korea is also squeezed between uh, China and, uh, and the US. Uh, 
for a long time. For example, the peace treaty with North Korea can only be signed by the US. And so this is imposing a, a, a quite a, a big constraint on the peace on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, it is isolated from the continent because there is a border uh, effect uh, on land. So South Korean ports are forced to bet on transshipment to, to develop. Their function is, uh, uh, of course, trade, but uh, mostly domestic trade. Uh, they cannot pretend to catch Chinese trade, uh, for example, um, by, uh, by land. Um, there is a rising competition from Chinese ports. Uh, for example, Shanghai is uh, more and more catching international transshipment from Fuzan, and this can be a threat in the port system of uh, Northeast Asia. Uh, a possible development uh, is the Arctic shipping, the Northern Sea route development from Asia to Europe by container, but it is uh, very unlikely because um, uh, of course, you will save time and cost to go through the Arctic, but in reality, uh, there are many factors that uh, make this route not reliable, such as uh, the lack of infrastructure, uh, the geopolitical uh, risk of passing uh, in uh, Russian waters, uh, and so on. Uh, I will talk about the trade reorientation towards China uh, a little bit later and uh, about North Korea as well. Uh, there are many tensions between US and China that are affecting uh, the situation right now. Uh, the list is not complete. Uh, it can be about uh, nuclear weapons, trade, uh, tariffs, uh, different kinds of sanctions uh, and also about the specific context with uh, Russia and Ukraine. And all of this is uh, increasing uh, the tensions and uh, because of this, its strong links uh, economically with China and geopolitically with the US, South Korea is uh, uh, squeezed in between. It is difficult for South Korea to find its, uh, its own uh, uh, way of action. I will uh, provide now uh, a small quantitative uh, uh, aspect of uh, the evolution of uh, uh, container shipping connections in Northeast Asia. So as you can see, uh, Fuzan in 1996 uh, was just starting to become a hub in Northeast Asia. Uh, you can see that its main connections are with Japan. It, it is connecting mostly uh, for transshipment uh, small Japanese ports on the West Coast, uh, on the East Sea. And uh, the, the system is dominated by Hong Kong and uh, some other uh, hubs. In 2006, you see the increase of Fuzan uh, domination, which now extends to North China, uh, Far East Russia, and many other Japanese small ports, also for transshipment, and also together with Pyongyang. In 2016, this domination has increased, uh, the traffic of North China ports has increased, but they are still under the control of Pusan transshipment, uh, together with Pyongyang and Incheon. And uh, Pusan is dominating almost all of Japan. Uh, the rest of China between Shanghai and Hong Kong is a different system. 
you can see also uh, in a Iran system, how it has evolved. The evolution. Iran system's change. Um, we must not forget that uh, in the meantime, uh, if we include not only container shipping but all kinds of shipping, uh, bulk, uh, liquid bulk, solid bulk, uh, general cargo, if we look at inter-Korean shipping, the evolution has been also uh, dramatic until the late 2000s. Uh, the, the, we can see a multiplication of connections between North and South Korea. Um, and until uh, sanctions by the UN uh, and uh, the stoppage of uh, connections or trade between North and South in the more recent period. As you can see, in the more recent period, uh, there has been um, less uh, connections, especially because of the um, sanctions on North Korean coal uh, exports. This is especially visible here with the evolution of North Korean shipping. Uh, there is a peak of activity in 2015 uh, related with uh, the coal trade, but after uh, it, is, it has almost uh, disappeared. Uh, one thing to be noted is that uh, North Korea in general is more and more under the influence of China. And this can be seen here with the uh, external connection uh, by size of traffic. Uh, this map shows the, the ports which are connected to North Korea uh, in the, the last 10 years and uh, the share of North Korean ships in this traffic. So Dalian is the main uh, hub for North Korea and uh, many coal ports are concerned as well. The China effect on South Korea is well known, so I will not develop too much this aspect. Uh, before the rise of China-US tensions, um, then uh, a lot of manufacturing companies from Korea uh, uh, left the country to China to profit from uh, labor cost, cheaper labor cost, cheaper logistic cost and land cost. Uh, so th there has been a rise of Korean FDI in China, mostly in the Yellow Sea uh, area, uh, such as uh, Shandong uh, province, for example. Uh, there has been a growth, a relative growth of trade with China uh, in total Korean trade. Uh, so this is reflected in the development of uh, short sea shipping between China and uh, South Korea. Uh, Busan is more uh, preferred for world shipping, global connections uh, with the, the America and uh, Europe but uh, Incheon, Pyeongtaek, uh, Kansan, uh, Desan, for example, are maybe more uh, efficient, more close also to, to China for a direct connection by short sea shipping. Um, the share of uh, Yellow Sea Korean ports has increased. Uh, over time. Of course, the figure is not updated. Uh, so, based on 
this evolution, uh, the problem faced by South Korea now uh, is to try to find uh, new markets to uh, lower its dependence on China uh, because all of these developments make uh, South Korea very much dependent on, on China, as was said by the previous uh, speaker. So um, the new Southern policy was developed after 2017. Uh, and uh, Seoul is trying to diversify its economic and strategic partnerships, uh, especially in the South Asia uh, region, in countries like Vietnam or Indonesia, for example. So this is something that could change the pattern of uh, port connections and port systems. Um, the new Southern policy is uh, highly complementary with US interests. Uh, so in some way to shift to the South would uh, make uh, South Korea closer to the US interest and uh, and maybe make it more balanced in terms of uh, 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 geopolitical uh, aspects. But uh, the trade of semiconductors, for example, is something that is not replaceable uh, uh, because the market is much more con much concentrated in China. So semiconductors, and uh, raw materials like uh, rare earths, uh, for example, uh, is uh, still uh, dominated by China for the years to come. There are other opportunities that arise, uh, for example, the development of the Hebei Kansai uh, line passing through Pusan. It's a multimodal project uh, which is already in operation and connects uh, uh, Japan, China, R Russia, uh, yes, and Europe through a freight uh, railway network. Um, it also connects uh, Wuhan to, uh, to Japan. And this can be an opportunity for Korea to, to develop uh, uh, trade and transshipment with uh, Europe. Perspective for the future, I would say that um, although relationships with uh, North Korea are getting worse uh, these days, as we see with the decapitation policy of the military uh, force in uh, South Korea, uh, the discourse is becoming more and more aggressive, but uh, some journalists say that the South Korea should continue to cooperate with North Korea about uh, minerals, for example, uh, to reduce the reliance on China. Maybe uh, South Korea should reopen Kaesong Industrial Complex maybe it should develop free trade zones in the north for its companies around the ports like Nampo. This is an idea that has been going on for uh, several years, but which has always been uh, delayed uh, because of political uh, tensions or unstable uh, political regime in the north. Uh, the coastal shipping between the two Koreas would actually be an environmental friendly. Uh, a hub and spoke system could be put in place to connect the new free trade zones and the global uh, maritime network. Um, that's what I, I have to say. Uh, so I think that uh, overall, uh, South Korean ports, they proved that they can reach the maximum of their ability in terms of efficiency, connectivity. Uh, you have among the top container terminals in the world in South Korea, 
automated terminals, uh, uh, state-of-the-art technologies, but uh, what next? So how can uh, South Korea diversify its port activity? Uh, I think so one option is that uh, to develop this inter-Korean connectivity, which uh, is uh, still a promising uh, market. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Degree, for your interesting presentation. Well, and what was quite impressive to me was that, yes, you are a French researcher, but the last part of your presentation, you highlighted a couple of, I mean, factors. The first one was that, well, when we had a good inter-Korean relations, we have kind of, I mean, pan EC kind of logistics, I mean, routes and initiatives. There were a lot of talks about that, but what Dr. Decree said is that, well, at the moment, yes, the relationship, inter-Korean relationship is not really good, but still we need to cooperate to utilize um, or at least connect the, I mean, the shipping routes and inland, I mean, the transportation lines to further, I mean, tap into the potential. So like, I mean, Professor Lee said that we should also pursue diversification, to reducing our dependency on China. And one way to do that is, I mean, based on new Southern policy, it's really, I mean, impressive to me, yes. And in the beginning of his presentation, yeah, he also pointed out about, I mean, how to tap into the, I mean, Northern Sea route. Yes, in the past, I mean, in the early 2000s, we also had some detailed discussions, but unfortunately, it's not developed further yet. Okay, now we have three discussants to share their insights and opinions. So focusing on the t two presentations under the topic of the global supply chain crisis and its solutions in the new Cold War era. First of all, we have, I mean, to, uh, Mr. Jung Yu Chol from KMI. He's the I mean director of Office of Macroeconomic Analysis and Forecasting, especially from KDI Korea Development Institute. Dr. Jung, please welcome him with a warm round of applause. Hello, everyone. Once again, my name is Jung Yu Chol. I'm a director of Office of Macroeconomic Analysis and Forecasting from KDI. It is my great honor and I'm very happy to be part of the discussion. So uh, I fully agree with what uh, Professor Lee Sung Ju said. Well, obviously, he touched upon all key elements, so I don't think I need to add, I mean, more important issues. But from a little bit of a different perspective, I'd like to just uh, share my ideas uh, how to understand the, I mean, the issue in this region, the global supply chain. It is a key element for any country to have a economic growth in the long-term perspective. So in the 1990s, if you look back up on the past, and back then Japan was, I mean, well acknowledged as one of them in the leading powers in terms of a global trade. And after, I mean, 1990s, South Korea has built its capabilities and it grew a lot and actually established a collaborative relationship with the Japan. But in the 2000s, rather than continuing, I mean, maintaining cooperation, cooperative relationship with Japan, now it's, South Korea is in competition with Japan. And if you look at China, I mean, in 2000, I mean, to joining the WTO and they were integrated in the global I mean, economy. And back then, as said before, as Korea and Japan cooperated in the 1990s, Korea and China cooperated as well. Yes, the Korea back then had a higher level of technology development, but uh, at the same time, I mean, China could offer very cheap labor. 
that is the reason why the two countries uh, can cooper could cooperate. But if you look further in detail, the, the I mean, Chinese economy, at the end of the day, they will grow further. So in the 1990s, actually, Korea tried to copy or emulate what Japan had done in the past. So yes, I mean, it, Korea succeeded because we started with, I mean, the things, easy ones, easy ones that we could actually rip the results relatively easy. But after 2010s, I mean, that the same thing happened with the relationship between China and Korea. Now China has their, I mean, growing economy. The, I mean, the labor cost is no longer that cheap and their technology, I mean, advancement is not something that we can ignore or say we have a much higher, I mean, advantage. So now we are in competition as well. I mean, partially we are still cooperating. And the, I mean, the natural strategy for South Korea, therefore, is that looking for other countries which can again to provide i mean cheap labor in other parts of the region meaning in southeast asia moving away from china and at the moment uh, i mean south korea exports intermediary goods to china and china is also exporting and intermediary goods to i mean south korea and other countries in the region as well so also, I mean, that the same thing happens in Vietnam. So there are kind of a really, I mean, more complex competition in the region. So again, in the past, Korea, Japan cooperated with each other in terms of, I mean, supply chain. But at the end of the day, that relationship evolved into competition. And similar trends will happen with China. But instead, yes, with the, I mean, growing, I mean, economy of China, now, the, I mean, final demand, the market in China is growing as well. So this also, I mean, presents uh, some opportunities to South Korea and other countries in the region as well and further expand, expanding trade. And regarding how to respond to the current situation, to, I once again, I mean, fully agree with what Professor Lee said. Yes, we certainly need to diversify the supply sources to secure stability of the global supply chain. And recently, unfortunately, many countries are actually choosing to have a protectionism when it comes to trade with other countries. But if you look at the, I mean, human history, countries which pursued openness, they grew faster and they grew bigger and they had a, I mean, higher level of income. So. That means openness is the right option for us as well. Closing our, I mean, borders is not the right way to go, and it will also further, I mean, to boost our technical, technological development. And from economical perspectives, I mean, liberal economy, free economy is still valid around the world. Again, protectionism will only hinder further technology developments. It will not help us as a country. And yes, I mean, many people talk about reassuring recently. And some people, many people say that we should put focus on that. But in fact, there are not many success stories of a reassuring. I believe the biggest reason is that, I mean, the, the countries who choose to reshore, reshoring, their competitiveness wasn't really good. So I don't think a reshoring is the kind of, I mean, panacea that can solve all the problems we have, no. So, I believe a diversification is the top priority for us. As already, I mean, to written in the many, I mean, articles. I mean, POSCO. Maybe you already know. I mean, we had a recent, I mean, typhoon. A couple of typhoons hit South Korea, and POSCO suffered quite tremendously. So, for example, I mean, the local and I mean, foreign companies which excessively dependent on the I mean material provision from POSCO suffered as well so last but not least one more thing I'd like to add is that I mean the, the US China I mean hegemonic struggle and there's a war in Ukraine but still we should not give up on diplomatic uh, solutions and Korea is sometimes squeezed between US, Russia, China, and EU, European nations, but we are no small power. We have an important role to play as a really important member of the international community. Maybe this is a time for us to take the initiative to show our leadership as well. Thank you very much. 
Uh, I uh, hope um, you could abide by your time. And uh, please give our discussant a big hand. Our uh, second pr um, discussant is from the U.S. So we'd like to know the views from um, the U.S. That's why we have Professor Lee Eun Su from New Jersey City University. And he majored in transportation um, physics. And we would like to know the um, the issues related to the global supply chain from the perspective of the U.S. I'll give you five minutes. Uh, thank you. I am a professor of uh, management at the School of Business at New Jersey City University. The U.S. is having a hegemony war, and it's um, doing a lot of things in this war. And if I may recall from my, my memories, you know, and when I was young, you know, in my neighborhood, you know, a boy uh, would hit bump into another one, and that the beginning of the war and the logistics of the war even broke out even about 10 years ago and at the time we were not really familiar with the term of supply chain and we were more familiar with the logistics and from sourcing production and distribution and reaching the customer you know all this in the process got more complicated and more um, multiplied and required a lot of competitions. See, the companies are competing in the market. It's a war of the companies, but it's not just a war of companies, you know, in which supply chain. So this is a war between supply chains. Everyone is now aware of this, you know, war in the supply chain and belonging to which um, supply chain will matter. And then the U.S. Um, does French shoring so that you know, friends can uh, have a supply chain to realize the values they want. And I think that was well um, presented by Professor E. If I may add, add my comment to it, we have to talk about supply chain, I mean value chain, before we talk about supply chain. The, so China, uh, in the past, focused on uh, light um, industry, then move on to the heavy industry and the electricity or vehicle industry. I mean, that's the actually economic development that Korea took. Uh, like Korea, the Southeast Asian countries uh, will follow suit, just like Korea did, and uh, Cor just like Korea follows suit uh, the Japan. And Korea is it became more competitive in the global market. Um, Japan uh, thought of it as a competitor, and as China is growing in the global market, people are thinking that it is now or never that they will be able to control China in the global market. The advancement of technology is one reason. Korea. It may, made a huge investment uh, in um, making this combustion engine vehicles. And um, China is focusing on um, producing uh, battery-based uh, vehicles. So it took much shorter uh, for China to advance this industry. With this um, technology in battery, we have to con be able to control China. But as I told you earlier, you know, for, in terms of battery technology, reshoring is not easy. That means you have to invest in the domestic market first. And that is the best way in sourcing. So that's a vertical integration in terms of geography. Professor Lee mentioned the structural changes. It's I, I make it, and I sell it, and I use it. So you know, from the national level, if if you expand it to the country level, it's like you know, per, um, my region produces it, and my region sells it, and my region consumes it. 
So we can say this is more like in you know, a vertical integration. And who should we pursue vertical integration with? In controlling China, the U.S. Uh, uses direct and indirect measures like um, Inflation Reduction Act or Floor uh, uh, Act or Build Back Better Framework. Those uh, acts have been passed over the last two years. So you have to control sourcing, manufacturing, shipping line to have control. So for the shipping line, they passed Build Back Better. And for sourcing, they um, passed Inflation Reduction Act. And if I may add, if I might add my comments, on what Korea can do is uh, we, uh, the, the U.S. began the supply chain risk analysis um, in 2017, and the Biden administration um, ordered to do the um, supply chain risk assessment in other areas as well. And that also included the labor union. The America's value So the external and internal values are human rights and sustainability, and the external values are the internal values are to man maintain the. Um, uh, uh, human talents. So Korea will have to make um, investment in R and D, and um, nurt and they, we should forge an environment where we can nurture um, uh, talents. I believe what uh, Dr. Lee said is that I mean, not asking a question, what we should do to diversify. Okay, next discussant is from the I mean the organizer of the. This session, KMI from KMI, and we have Mr. Lee Sung Woo. He's the chief of a regional cooperation committee. Well, he's majored in the I mean the maritime shipping and logistics, and I was informed that he's been living in Busan for nine years or so. Obviously, he knows well about Busan, and he's an expert in terms of I mean shipping and logistics. I'm sorry that you have only three minutes because we have a time constraint. And from the floor, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Then our staff will provide you with a paper so that you can write down your questions. And we will collect them and take a couple of moments to have a Q&A session once again. Mr. Lee, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, it's a lot of time that I have. Three minutes, okay. I will make sure that I have the best, I use the best of it. Okay. I was one of the designers of this session. So, I mean, yes, from geopolitical, I mean, perspectives, what are we going to discuss, I mean, in terms of logistics and international shipping? Yes, it's a really interesting topic. So, I'm very excited to be part of this, I mean, session. As you already know, like, I mean, Professor Lee and Prof Dr. Degree said, I fully agree with you. In general, I mean, yes, I mean, U.S. has been wielding great power around the world in terms of, I mean, trade. I mean, there were so-called four dragons in Asia. I mean, U.S. played a big role, actually, wielding this, I mean, the IMF, I mean, the past Asian financial crisis, we all suffered. So it's all intertwined, and we have a really complex situation at the moment. So yes, uh, now we are talking about ASEAN as an alternative for us. I mean, will it be really a viable alternative or not? So it's really interesting to hear your insights and opinions. So like inclusive, I mean, the economic so autonomy, how to build, I mean, better networks. I agree with you all in general. And. 
we have, I mean, experts who are actually involved in working in the logistics and shipping area in Busan. We feel the risk, I mean, every day. I mean, I have data here two years before, five years before. I mean, items exported from, I mean, South Korea to China, the majority is actually intermediary goods. What it means is that, yes, we send intermediary goods to China, then China actually make a finished goods, and then they export again to the U.S. and other parts of the world, including Europe. So if we do not have this existing I mean, supply chain we have in East Asia, what will happen? Well, what will happen to Busan in particular? Once again, as you already know, I mean, Busan at the moment is the world's second largest transshipment port. And 70% of the cargo is from actually China. So this will disappear. Okay, then can we find, I mean, or to offset it from ASEAN? No. I mean, these countries will use Singapore and Hong Kong. They have no reason to, to travel or navigate all the way to Busan. So nobody actually mentioned this risk. So, I mean, how are we going to enhance Busan port and how are we going to build more ports in Korea? Many people are focusing on that, so I'm quite worried about that. We should have a broader picture and we should realize this reality. And uh, it's a, such a pity that I don't have enough time to discuss further. But again, I in general agree with the, I mean, Professor Lee, but I'd like to have uh, three suggestions. First one is that we have a still unstable, I mean, logistics governance. Once again, I mean, the majority is that I mean, the authority is the Oceans and Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries. But, I mean, it's the only body? No, we have, I mean, the Agriculture Ministry, and we have, I mean, the Ministry for Budgets and Finance. They should all work together. It's not well aligned. That's the first, I mean, problem. And the second one, I mean, when we have a problem with the supply chain, who comes in and there's, I mean, trade chief from the, I mean, the, the Department of Foreign Affairs. Then he says, okay, I do not have all the details. I call somebody from the I mean, the Land and Transportation Ministry. And then call me the head of the I mean, Oceans and Fisheries Industry, I mean, the Ministry. So again, to have a really competitive, I mean, the ports and logistics industry in the country, we should have a really well aligned authority, the I mean, central governance system, but it's not well aligned. Therefore, even if I mean, South Korea is really well known with its advanced high techs, I mean, the, the AI and others, we have these all smart technologies, which can be fully tapped into for I mean, further development of our logistics and shipping industry. But it's not happening because of this, I mean, really red taped, I mean, well, not well aligned, I mean, governance in Korea. So when we lose this chance, it will, I mean, the others will take the chances. And the third one is that there's, a, there should be a really well balanced reconciliation between the, I mean, past and future. We need to understand the risks from the past and learn our lessons and reduce the risk for the future. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to ask um, Dr. I mean, I mean, Dr. Decree, you are not asked for uh, you know, concrete answers, but um, while I was listening to the presentation of Dr. De Crie, uh with the um, rising confrontation between the U.S. and China, uh, I think um, the, the crisis is looming on Busan port. That's what I, uh, I felt or realized during the presentation by Dr. De Crie. And as there is no direct question to um, Dr. De Crie, could you share with us your comments uh, regarding the entire discussions and presentations? And then after that, we're going to wrap up the session with the questions uh, raised to Professor Lee Sung Ju. Dr. De Crie, I'll give you a couple of minutes to give us your comments or opinions after uh, I mean, you may have about the session or the presentations or discussions. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me uh, another opportunity to express uh, myself. Um, 
I fully agree with uh, Dr. Uh, Lee Song Wu uh, about the, um, the risk of the current situation to make uh, Puzan uh, lose uh, part, at least part of its uh, transshipment activity, uh, especially with China. Uh, because as I said in my presentation, uh, and this is something that everybody knows, uh, because Korea is very much relying on transshipment for its port activity. Uh, we know in uh, transport geography that uh, transshipment activity is quite footloose. Uh, it is not. Um, it is an activity which can shift from one port to another port quite easily, um, especially in the case of port competition. Uh, so um, if uh, the tensions between China and US motivate uh, the shift of, uh, for example, manufacturers um, to um, manufacturing firms to uh, South Asia, for example, uh, then um, the, the pattern of uh, uh, commodity chains or the pattern of uh, uh, value chains will uh, change. Uh, so uh, Puzan uh, will lose uh, some part of its transshipment activity because this transshipment activity is uh, actually very local. It is a very local activity um, within the region of Northeast Asia. It is not an activity uh, connected with uh, uh, it is not something uh, global. It is a connection between the global and the local, uh, mostly for the North, North China and Yellow Sea uh, systems. So this is what I, should, I, I can say. Um, and how can Puzan replace this uh, possible uh, loss? Uh, this is an issue that uh, uh, Korean port authorities or the ministry should uh, think about uh, seriously. Um, and this is why I proposed to focus on uh, inter-Korean uh, relationships as a way to, um, to compensate uh, uh, the, this kind of risk in the future. Uh, of course, inter-Korean uh, trade or transshipment is also uh, risky. Uh, there is no insurance that this can succeed in the future. Um, but if uh, the US and China can uh, allow the two Koreas to work together peacefully, then um, it can be made uh, possible, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, comes. Thank you very much. We have one minute left. So I will, I mean, to pass the microphone to Professor Lee. I mean, openness, reassuring, diversifications. Yes, you have one minute to wrap all that up. Yes, I mean, the three discussions shared such a good insights and ideas and pointed, made a really good point. So I certainly want to have, I mean, more time to have, I mean, deeper discussion. But due to time constraint, uh, let me share with you just uh, three points. Reassuring, yes, there can be several effects. But what I'd like to tell you here is that uh, reassuring at this point is a reality. There are, I mean, goods and bads, I mean, uh, disadvantages and advantages. So we need to clearly understand and how make our way to respond on not on the I mean national level but also on the I mean company level. They should build I mean actually realistic plans. And the second point I'd like to make here is that I mean personally made a really accurate I mean Points. Yes, there are, I mean, the competition between companies, but there are a competition in terms of, I mean, supply chain. But the soundness or the health of the supply chain, how to maintain it, how to expand it, how to enhance it, the key is to have a really sound competition. The supply chain should be always, I mean, 
have a good competition and it should be open to all players. And last but not least, like I mean, Professor Lee mentioned, I fully agree with you at the moment. I mean, how to respond to such challenges? I mean, there are preemptive I mean, response and then the post response. So yes, how to minimize the costs and efforts, that should be our focus. And in that context, yes, I think uh, we should have a real kind of a holistic or pan-government response. We need to have a really good governance. I fully agree with you. At the moment, it's really fragmented. Yes, uh, thank you again. And I only gave you just I mean, three minutes. You used it really well. We had a really interesting and insightful presentation by two speakers and three I mean, discussants. And I'd like to thank all the participants from the floor as well, showing your interest. And once again, I'd like to give a special thanks to Dr. Decree. I mean, he's joining the symposium from far away and still shared a really interesting, very impressive insights and showed a keen interest in not French issues, but on our, I mean, Korean financial issues. And with this, we will wrap up this session and we will have take just a quick break and we will be back for the last session. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's give us a big hand to all the participants to the session. We're going to take about 10 minute break. And uh, we prepared some coffee and water in the terrace right behind the um, stage. And we're going to have a 10 minute break and see you in 10 minutes. 10분간 휴식 시간 갖도록 하겠습니다. 고맙습니다.